When I was around 17, I had gotten home from work rather late, and went straight into my room to change, and found myself hungry. It was probably around 1am by this time, and I didn't want to cook anything and make too much noise, as I was afraid I'd wake the parents. So when I ventured to my kitchen, I started shuffling through the cupboards, looking for a quick fix of snack food to tide me over into the morning. Now, our kitchen was positioned so that the kitchen door led to our backyard. The door itself was an old wooden door, but my dad had added one of those metal security screen gate doors on the outside for good measure. It was one of the security gates where the holes on the doors were small enough so that some insects could not get through, and therefore we could leave the wooden door open in the summer to allow for a breeze to go through the house. In addition to the security door, my dad had also installed one of those auto security lights. You know the ones. They go on automatically wherever their motion sensor is triggered. Usually the light would only turn on when I would let out my dog to pee at night. However, on this night, he was already lounging in my room, waiting for me to come back with some snacks for him as well. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I was busy creeping through the cupboards, and finally hit the jackpot with some Pop-Tarts. Knowing my dog, I didn't want the chance of him snagging a tart from my hand, so I ate it as I opened them up, and started munching on them in the kitchen. As I'm eating the first Pop-Tart, I hear a whistling sound from outside, as the wooden door was open. At first I thought it was the wind, but then I noticed that the whistling was a distinct tune, not random whistling. I didn't know the tune, but I could tell that it was from a song. It sounded like a happy and sad song all rolled into one. I know that doesn't make sense, but that's the best way I can describe it. After standing there for about 20 seconds, I decided that it must be one of my friends that lives right down the block screwing with me. Maybe they are on the other side of the fence, and whistling there to scare me. Right when I'm thinking this, I see the security lights suddenly turn on. I quickly look around the surrounding area, but don't see anyone or anything that could have set the light off. The whistling is still going. Now I'm in a semi-panic mode. Is it one of my friends? If so, where are they hiding? If it's not, then who is it? I am stuck standing there now, as I can't move as I stare outside waiting for something to happen. Nothing does. A minute or so goes by, with the whistling continuing, and the light remaining on. Suddenly the whistling gets louder, and I see the doorknob to the metal door start to move up and down, and can see through the metal door to see that there's no one there. The whistling sounds like it's right outside now, and the doorknob keeps moving like someone is trying to get in. The security light is still on so I have a clear view of the front of the door, and know for sure there's no one there. Screw the Pop-Tarts, I dropped the box and jetted back to my room, slammed and locked the door, and hid under my blankets with a baseball bat and my dog. I never went out to the kitchen at night after that. That is easily the second most scariest thing that has ever happened to me, but I can write that off as someone messing with me. However, the incident that happened in the cabin still creeps me out. The first reason being that if it was all in my head, I was in a really messed up place at the time. The second being, if it really did happen, then what the hell did I see? I think it's best I take it from the top. I'll be the first to say that all this stuff could have taken place in my head. The mind is a freaky thing, and can play some pretty trippy tricks on you. Whenever I was scared as a kid, my dad had always told me that in life, you should not be scared of ghosts. Fear the living, 
because they can actually hurt you. In my late teenage years, I came into some money after my father committed suicide, and I received an inheritance from him. At time of dad's passing, he and mum owned a cabin up in Oregon by Mount Bachelor. The cabin had been put up for sale since my mum could no longer afford the payments, and renting it was not covering the payments either. The cabin was set to go on the market for sale in less than a month, and was in the process of finalising all the paperwork with the realtor and lawyer. So for that month's time, the cabin was not going to be rented out any longer, and was going to be vacant. I saw this as a chance to get away for a while, and clear my head in light of all the things going on. I quit work, packed up my snowboarding gear, grabbed my dog, and headed up in my dad's car, that he had willed to me, and to the cabin I went. Now this was our family cabin, that my parents rented out throughout the year when we weren't using it. I had keys to the cabin, and also had the code for the alarms, so I did not feel the need to stop at the rental management company, and advise them of my stay. This has nothing to do with the coming story, but I felt it necessary to mention anyway. My first two days at the cabin were normal, and nothing out of the unusual happened. I spent my days playing with my dog in the snow, snowboarding, and in the evenings playing PlayStation or listening to music, drinking and smoking out of the balcony. I had already stocked up on food, cigarettes, and liquor, so I was pretty much a shut-in, aside from the occasional out to hit the slopes. With my dog as company, and DVDs and a PlayStation as entertainment, I was quite content and started to feel relaxed after all the drama that had preceded my outing. The cabin itself was two stories. Bottom story had the living room and a single guest bedroom along with a small kitchen. Upstairs had another two rooms, along with a walkout balcony, attached to the master bedroom. Most of my time was spent either in the living room, kitchen, or master bedroom. I never ventured into the other rooms, and always kept the doors leading into them shut. Open doors to dark rooms have always creeped me out. Anyhow, the third day came around, and I was still going through my usual routine of playing with my dog midnight, playing games, and watching DVDs. That day it was pretty heavy snowfall so I did not feel like trekking down the hill to the main road into my car, and decided to stay in. That's when things started to get a bit weird. In our area, there were only two other cabins adjacent to ours, maybe a block away from each other. All other cabins, aside from these two, were around a mile away from ours. Surrounding us was mostly forests, and very tall pine trees. Both of these cabins were empty, and for the past couple of days, I knew that no one was currently staying there. I've given enough background, and I'm now going to jump into the weirdness. Around midday, while outside with my dog, I noticed what looked like fresh footprints in the snow around the area surrounding our cabin. It was still snowing, so the footprints looked semi-fresh, like someone had been there in the last 20 to 30 minutes. I thought that maybe someone was staying in the cabin near me, and that I may have not noticed. Maybe they were shut-ins like me. Alright, whatever. The prints led away from my cabin, and they disappeared into the snow towards the denser part of the trees. I disregarded the footprints, and went back inside. Night time came, and I decided to head to bed. My dog Midnight was laying on the bed with me, when I noticed his ears perk up 
to a standstill slash listening position. This was followed by him quickly jumping off the bed and running downstairs to the living room. I lay in bed and stayed silent. I was kind of freaked out and could hear him moving around downstairs back and forth. After around five minutes, he ran back upstairs to me and started to do his doggy dance for the sign that he had to pee or he wanted to go outside. Oh, fine. I can't say no to him. So we both went downstairs to the outside driveway for him to do his thing. Only he didn't want to pee. As soon as we were outside, he started to pull on his leash, trying to drag me where he wanted to go. He kept looking up to the dense part of the trees where the prince had been earlier. But he also kept sniffing the side of the house and looking up towards the roof. After he figured out that I was not going to go where he wanted, he sat himself down and just stared into the darkness. A bit unusual for him, but all right. Maybe there are forest animals out there that he wants to chase down. But screw this, I didn't want to chance anything. So I pulled him back inside and we both headed back upstairs. Around half an hour later, I was lying in bed when I heard what sounded like hooves walking on my roof. It was only a series of about six steps, and I rationalized that it could be a pine cone falling from a tree onto the roof, or maybe a kind-hearted forest animal running around. But here's the thing. The steps seemed to be spaced apart, like a man-length stride. So it was really freaking me out. Midnight also heard the noise, and was quick to run to the balcony screen door, expecting for me to let him out. All right, you know what? I'm a tough guy, and at the time considered myself to be fairly well built and strong enough to handle myself. So I grabbed my coat and shoes, along with my cigarettes and a flashlight, and went out onto the balcony. Screw it, right? As soon as I was outside, I lit up my cigarette and started canvassing the roof with my light. Nothing. And the snow on top was undisturbed. Weird. Must have all been in my head, right? What about midnight hearing the noise, though? Maybe he was feeding off my paranoia. I started to calm down and relax again. My eyes started to adjust to the darkness, and I kept smoking and just staring at the stars and trees next to our cabin. That's when I saw it. In a tree that was a little taller than our cabin, around 20 feet away from the balcony, I saw what looked like a man, crouched in a squatting position, in between two branches. It was squatted on one branch, and its arms were extended above its head, holding onto the branch above it. What the hell was that? I wasn't sure if I was really seeing this thing, and stood just staring, and sat there motionless. I noticed Midnight stand up, and start pacing behind to me, and lightly barking at the same time. The thing still did not move. I put my cigarette out, and was debating on shining the light into this thing's direction. But something in my head kept screaming not to. So I walked backwards to the inside of the room. Once inside, I locked the door and shined my flashlight into the thing's direction. But there was nothing there. I shut the curtains to the screen door and retreated back to bed. But later on in the night, I heard a light tapping at the screen door, like someone was tapping on the glass with their fingers. It was consistent and didn't stop for nearly an hour. Midnight seemed to stare at the door, but he wouldn't go anywhere near it. 
not anymore. The weirdest part was that I had a feeling like someone was inviting me to open the door. But at the same time, I kept hearing my dad's voice in my head, telling me to stay in bed and not to do it. I listened to my dad's voice and just stayed where I was. I passed out eventually and woke up in the morning and everything was normal. The rest of the week I spent there was non-eventful and nothing else out of the ordinary happened. I totally admit that it could have been all in my head. A lot of stuff was going on at the time, so I was pretty messed up from all the drama. But it still bugs me even now, after a lot of time has passed. I'm married now and have two young kids, but I'm still partially afraid of the dark. When I was younger, my dad told me this story from a hunting trip he went on in the Appalachian Mountains. He spent the majority of the day without seeing a thing, and was ready to pack up and leave when a white-tailed deer showed up. He shot it, but it ran away, and he had to go and track it down. About a half hour later, he came across the downed animal, after following a very distinct blood trail. Shortly after, he began field dressing the deer, a group of four armed men in regular clothing walked through the forest and approached him. He always describes them as mountain men when he tells the story. Anyway, one of the men told my dad the deer was their kill, and that he should leave. My dad, never one for confrontation, argued that he had just shot it, and that he followed the blood trail all the way to the deer. At this point, the men unslung their rifles and pointed them at my dad, telling him these are their mountains, and that they'll be taking the deer. They made claims that people have hunting accidents all the time, and how unfortunate it would be for him to have one. He left and called the police, which resulted in the responding officer telling my dad that there was nothing they could do about it, because they don't want to have a fight on their hands with the locals. East Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen. There are remote cypress swamps along the Pearl River in central Mississippi, and some of them become inaccessible due to flooding during hunting season. The remoteness of some of these places create ideal situations for a hunter willing to put in the extra effort, and I have hunted these woods and swamps for years, and know them well, even though it's a bad idea. When I was younger, I was confident enough to hunt back in there alone. One afternoon during duck season, a front was coming in, and I knew if I could get to Deal Island, that would be a good day. I put on my chest waders and rode my four wheels down an overgrown logging trail in the swamp to the edge of the flood. I waded a couple of sloughs and got to a particular honey hole where I could slay them. I did, and it was good. But, when it came to wade back, I got a sense of unease that I cannot explain. The weather was odd, because even though the temperature was dropping and a front was expected, everything was absolutely still and quiet. If you've ever been alone in a swamp at night, you'll know what I mean. But everything is different, when the only things that you can see is what comes out from the cone of your flashlight. I wasn't worried because my light was good, and hell, I was carrying a 12 gauge shotgun. But still, something kept making the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I was being watched, and I could feel it. Sound carries funny in the swamp, but the sloshing noises I was making were the only things I could hear. It was echoing back to me in funny ways, and when I stopped to adjust the strap on the bag of decoys, the sloshing echoes did not stop when it should have. Okay, there's something else in the swamp. No big deal. Some deer or hog would realise I'm a human in a minute and move away. Except it didn't. I would move for a bit and then stop and listen. The sound of something else out there would stop, but it was getting closer. Not normal. The cone of my flashlight made the trees and tangled brush 
cast long, scraggly shadows that moved with me. I tried to hurry out of the swamp. My knuckles were turning white on that Remington 870, and I was wishing I was loaded with something heftier than a number two steel shot. I noticed a very bad smell, like skunk, except much worse, and stopped again to listen and shine my light around. I noticed how the shadows continued to move, but holy crap, I'm not moving. Why are the goddamn shadows moving? A limb snapped, and when I spun around to face it, something that was not there made a soft hissing noise. The beam of my light just ended in a shape of nothingness that was not there. A breath of stench hit my face, and I heard that hissing sound again, and I got the hell out of that swamp. I was shaking and drenched in sweat when I got back to the truck, and those woods did not feel like my woods anymore. When I say it was something that was not there, that's the only way I can describe it. My light hit it, and there was shadow behind it there was nothing there. Something in the swamp scared the crap out of me, and I do not want to know what it was. This happened to my grandma in the late 50s. She would have been in her mid-twenties. She was camping with her husband and kids. She liked to wake up early to jog before coming back to fix breakfast just as everyone else was waking up. One time she was jogging on the sidewalk and a white car pulls up alongside her and says, a girl as pretty as you shouldn't be out here without her husband. Someone might decide to steal you. <laughs> she just said that she'd be fine and kept jogging. And the man drove away. A bit further, this sidewalk strays about 20 feet or so into the road. This strip of land between the road and sidewalk is forested, and you could kind of see the road throughout the foliage. The opposite side of the sidewalk was a forest. As she was jogging, she saw a glimpse of a person running from the direction of the road into the forest. It startled her, and she stopped jogging for a second. She looked around, and could see pulled over on the side of the road was the car of the guy who talked to her earlier. But the car was empty. She realized that the guy had driven further up the sidewalk, pulled over and hidden in the woods. Of course, she was scared and ran as fast as she could back to her campsite. She said it ruined jogging for her, and she never had the courage to jog alone again for the rest of her life. I used to be a field appraiser. I was at a parcel and was doing data collection for some 20 foot shipping containers that had appeared in the last several months. It was obvious they were being used as hunting cabins during hunting season. As I was finishing up, I turned around to walk back to my vehicle and standing right there were two hunters. They were dressed head to toe like snipers with ghillie suits on and large caliber rifles pointing right at me. That, as you can imagine, scared the heck out of me. Of course, they were mouthy and pissed off towards me. Then when they found out what I was doing, that escalated things even more. I don't blame them really. They saw me walking around looking and measuring everything and taking photos of the place. This happened back in 2012 when I was 15. There is a youth center in my city that used to do annual camping trips to Sweden. Me and my two friends, Sarah and Michelle, decided to go. The campground was set with an office and a kiosk at the entrance and all of the caravans and tents behind it. In front of the office was a giant parking lot that you would have to cross to get to the showers and bathrooms. The office was located in one corner and the bathrooms in the opposite corner furthest away. There were three male teachers with us on this trip, all in their mid twenties. Every day, 
they would take us to a supermarket nearby, in case we wanted something that the kiosk did not sell. While we were in line to pay, we noticed a guy, probably in his early 20s. He was dressed in black cargo pants, big leather boots, and a leather jacket. Despite it being over 30 degrees, but the most noticeable thing about him was his hair, or lack thereof. He had no hair, no eyebrows, and no eyelashes. He looked like he had gone through chemotherapy. We kind of felt sorry for him because he was so young, and we talked about him on our way back. When we got back, we hung out a bit, just chilling in the lake before we went to the kiosk to buy something to drink. When we saw the guy again, we thought it was a coincidence, even though there weren't that many people on the campsite, he could very well be living there. Later that afternoon, Sarah had to use the bathroom, and because it was so far away and slightly deserted, me and Michelle went with her. There was a bench and a table just outside the cabin that held the bathrooms, and guess who was sitting there? The same guy from earlier. He was sitting there with three friends, two girls and a guy. And when we got close enough, he stood up, and looked like he wanted to say something. Sarah and Michelle, who have always been a bit paranoid, sped up, and went into the bathroom. And I hung back a bit, and asked if he wanted anything. He looked after my friends, and started shaking his head, and sat back down. I kind of stood there for a few seconds, because he looked so sad before joining my friends. Me and Michelle sat in the changing room adjacent to the bathroom, and after a couple of minutes, one of the girls from outside came in and started speaking to us in Swedish. Even though the Scandinavian languages are quite similar to each other, it can still be challenging to understand. So we spent a few minutes explaining that we weren't Swedish, before she started speaking broken English. She told us that her friend, the bald guy, was very shy, and if we wanted to go and speak with him for a few minutes. Now, we were three girls in a foreign country, and he was at least a couple of years older than us. We didn't want to speak with him, and we told her this. She was talking to us for more than 20 minutes. At the start, she wanted us to just have a chat with him. Then she wanted one of us to go into his tent with him. Then she asked us to sleep with him. At this point, she was very frantic, and just kept switching from Swedish to English. So it was kind of hard to understand. But she said in Swedish, You just need to sleep with him. If you don't do it, he'll do it to me. At this point, Sarah was finally done in the bathroom, and came out to see what was happening. The girl looked like she was about to cry, and left the room. Sarah wanted to see who it was, so we all look out the little window, and I'm glad that we did. We saw the girl say something to the guy. He looked over to the bathroom door, and slammed his fists onto the table, got up, and walked over to the door. We didn't know what to do, because he was blocking the only exit. So we all went into the little bathroom and locked the door. We heard the guy knocking on the door to the changing room, and we all held our breaths. After a while, he knocked again, but we still kept quiet, not even moving. After a while, we heard the door open, but he was clearly trying to be quiet about it. He slowly walked towards the bathroom door, and all we could hear was the heavy sound of his boots on the floor. He sat down just outside the door, and just sat there, for 45 minutes. We could hear his heavy breathing on the other side of the door for those 45 minutes. We didn't care about how much noise we made. We already knew 
we were there. We tried to find the number for the Swedish police, but we didn't have any service on our phones because we were in a different country and we didn't have our teacher's number, so we couldn't call them. We just sat there panicking for the most part. Suddenly he got up, kicked to the door and walked outside again. We were dead quiet and didn't move for another 10 minutes, scared that he was trying to lure us out. All of a sudden, the door opened again and we could hear someone fumbling with something, either keys or some tools. We were afraid that he had found something to open the door with. But then we remembered that there was this little box that you could put money into to get the showers started. We asked who it was and someone responded, the janitor or something akin to that. I was kind of in shock and didn't hear properly to be honest. We took a chance and slowly opened the door, ready to close it again quickly if it were him. The man on the other side wasn't the same guy though, as he was at least 60. We asked him if he saw the other guy and he told us he'd told him to leave as he had seen him leave the girls changing room. We thanked the man and started walking towards the office. We were met there by the owner and she quickly got our teachers there. We were all very shocked. So it was hard to get the words out of us. But in the end, we managed to tell our teachers what had happened. All the teachers were outraged and two of them immediately left to see if they could find the guy. That night, the police came to talk with us and told us that sleep with in Swedish means the exact same thing it does in English. And the fact that the girl said that he was going to do it to her really showed his intentions. The police never found the guy, but we discovered that the two teachers that went to look for him did find him. We overheard a conversation between the teachers and apparently they threatened him so bad he almost cried. I understand why. The teachers were both quite tall and strong. For the longest time, I still got the creeps every time I saw a bald guy. This happened to my grandfather about 50 years ago. He was an avid hunter, but after this incident, his love of hunting pretty much stopped. He always tells this story with a chill in his eye. He explains that many years ago, he was out hunting in the forest for white-tailed deer. He had a really good spot and was just waiting on the ground under a tarp for something to happen. Whilst he was waiting, did he notice something unusual in the background? There was talking. And before he knew it, five men, all dressed in suits and shades, started walking through the forest. They were all silent. They didn't look anywhere except straight ahead. They walked and he was unsure what people were doing in such a remote area. He didn't say anything at first, but feeling very creeped out, thinking that maybe they were government officials and that there was something very wrong in this area. He got out from his hiding place and started approaching them. That's when they all stopped and turned and looked at him in unison. As he approached them and was giving them a greeting, did they all vanish into thin air? Bear in mind that this was in the early hours of the morning and there was plenty of sunlight. He wasn't on any drugs or alcohol or medication and saw them as clear as day just vanish in front of him. He hightailed it back, drove home, never hunted again. I don't blame him. I get freaked out just thinking about it. I guess the best way to start this story is to just to start from the beginning and recount the incident as clearly as possible, or at least as clearly as I can recall after 25 years. In the early 1990s, a friend and I went on a camping trip 
in the Royal National Park just south of Sydney, Australia. The campground we chose was truly in the middle of nowhere, and one we'd been to a number of times before. And as a result, we knew exactly where we wanted to set up camp. From the car park, which was nearly empty, you would walk down a long bush track, down the side of a mountain, until you reached the bottom and came to a beach. At the right of which was a cabin area of the campground, which had one or two people in there. However, if you turned left, there was a very large grassy plain with a number of rolling green hills. The last of these hills before a second vast green field had a point where the land came to a cliff overlooking the ocean. The downside of this hill was covered in trees, so you'd have to follow the top of the hill inland until you came to a small path through the trees leading down to a second field, which was surrounded by a forest. On the far side of this field was a small alcove in the walls of trees which made a perfect windbreak and was a 10 meter walk to the beach. This was our preferred campsite, and we'd been there a number of times before. By the time we reached our destination, it was just after 2 p.m. We set up camp, walked to the beach, had a swim, and were just milling around our camp, starting to get ready for the night ahead. It was at this point we decided to start to get our campfire ready to light. We had done a bit of camping before, but weren't what you'd consider experienced outdoorsmen. For example, if we didn't have matches or a lighter, we would have no way of starting a fire. It was at this point that we realized the matches we had brought on our way to the campground were still in the center console of our car. We tossed a coin and I lost. So I started the long trek back to the car to get them. By the time I did and got back down to the path to the forest field, it was now an hour or so until sunset. So it would be dark by the time I got back to camp. I did have my heavy duty flashlight, you know the kind, black metal cylinder body, the ones that are favored by law enforcement departments around the world. So I could see where I was going. It was sturdy and reliable and doubled up as a weapon if I ever found myself in a situation where I was in need of one. I reached the last hill as I found the path through the trees and made my way down to the second field. When I cleared the trees, I found my friend standing there. I asked him what he was doing and he said he'd come to help me since I was obviously having some trouble. I asked him what he meant and he said he'd seen my flashlight beam sweeping around the top of the hill for at least half an hour or so. I told him I'd only reached the path a few minutes ago, so it couldn't have been me. He was looking past me towards the top of a hill when he suddenly says, who else was up there? No one, I reply. So where's that light coming from? I turned around and sure enough at the top of the hill, I can see a beam of light swinging back and forth. I knew no one was up there. I'd just been up there, and it was a field with nowhere to hide. I shone my flashlight up in that direction, and the light suddenly went away. Almost as soon as that happened, my flashlight died. It had been working properly up until a second beforehand, but as soon as I aimed it towards the top of that hill, it stopped working. But that wasn't the strangest thing that happened not even close. As we're standing on the edge of the trees, looking up where the lights had been, we suddenly became aware of a building standing on the edge of the cliff. This couldn't be. There was no building here. There had never been a building here. We'd been here at least four times before, and there had never been anything on that cliff that remotely resembled a building. 
even if there had been. I would have seen it when I was up there just five minutes before. We stood, staring at it, trying to figure out exactly what we were looking at, when suddenly we noticed a couple of silhouettes moving around it. They moved to the building, past it, to the cliff, and back again. As they reached the side of the building closest to us, the silhouettes in the building faded away. They just vanished. Gone. We looked at each other, trying to figure out what we had just seen, when my flashlight came back on. This did nothing to help our nerves. We quickly turned around and hurried back across the field to our campsite. Once we had our campfire lit and had eaten, we sat around the fire and talked about what we had seen. Neither of us had any way of explaining what had happened. Hallucination? How could we have a shared hallucination? What would we tell people that would make us not sound crazy? We couldn't think of a way to relay our story. So we decided there and then to never tell anyone what we knew. We didn't need to. We could live quite happily, only talking about it amongst ourselves. The next day we packed up our camp and headed back to the car. As we passed that spot where the building would have been, we stopped to investigate, and there were no physical signs of anything ever having been there. The grass was long and undisturbed. You could see where I had walked through it the night before, and we carried on. Got back into the car, and drove the hour back home in almost complete silence. We occasionally discussed this incident a few times, but as time went by, we both tried to forget it. It wasn't until my friend's death that I started thinking about it again. I thought that maybe the anonymity of the internet would help me feel comfortable sharing this story. I still have never been back to that campsite. Just telling this story puts me on edge. But that's just stupid. Things like this can't exist. Can they? I went on my first solo camping trip when I was 21. I took my miniature Dachshund with me, stayed in a remote campground where there was hardly anyone. In the middle of the night, I was woken up several times by the sound of chanting, yelling, and singing from across the river, not in the campground itself but within hearing distance. Freaked out, I snuggled up to my dog, and finally fell asleep with her on my chest. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a jolt and a chill going through my body. I opened my eyes, tipped my head back, and looked through the tiny square vent in the tent directly behind my head. An older man's face was looking at me through the tent window. A man, with long black hair and big black eyes. I was so terrified that I couldn't move. I couldn't even make a sound, and I certainly tried. At some point, my dog, a miniature dashend, sensed my tension and woke up too. She was still sleeping smack dab in the center of my chest. She looked out the window directly at whatever it was that was behind me, and let out a single, sharp, growling bark. The moment she barked, my body relaxed, and I was able to move again. And I realized I may have been asleep, and experiencing sleep paralysis the whole time. There was nobody behind the tent anymore. It was very possible that it was a very realistic, freaky dream. Or did my dog save me? It was the summer after seventh grade. My mother had signed me up for church camp, which would result in both wonderful and terrifying events. I was the definition of a teenager at this point. My hormones were all over, just like my acne, and I wanted nothing more than a boyfriend. As the church bus loaded up, 
I noticed someone who I had never seen around before. He was tall and slender, with nice hair. His name was Chris. I might add that upon that first glance, I was well aware that he was out of my league. After arriving at the camp's destination, the whole, maybe eight of us, were already well acquainted. We would go on to be somewhat of a group the entire time. There were many other churches at the camp, and not all of them were like ours. Many of the girls were mean, and there was definitely a group of jocks. The sermon for the week was centred around heroes, and how you could be someone's hero. It encouraged us to reach out and become friends with people who didn't have any. It was much more of an anti-bullying session than a Bible lesson. A couple of days go by, and our group had become much tighter. It is down to about three of us that are inseparable, and Chris is one of them. I still think highly of him at this point, and undoubtedly my self-esteem cannot see him any more than a friend. While we're on break, my group of friends notice a kid that is all alone. He is very thin, with a head full of blonde curls. We know right off the bat that he's strange. His name is Nathan. Nathan was indeed lonely, and the week was about being a hero. So we go ahead and invite him to sit down with us at lunch. Looking back, now I can identify some very disturbing characteristics about Nathan. At lunch that day, he wasn't interested in his food. He was too busy catching moths in the window of the cafeteria. After he'd caught one, he showed us how they acted when he pulled their legs and wings from their bodies. He mutilated about four bugs in the time that he was meant to be spent eating. And his plate remained untouched. Nathan was especially fond of me. I didn't find him attractive, so I was oblivious to the fact that he was very into me. He was never three feet away from me after that lunch. He sat next to me during every sermon, and was what I now know as clingy. He would even go as far as to walk with me to the restroom and wait for me during break. The camp decided one day to do a special Bible study. It was broken up by church, so we went back to the Three Amigos. I don't know how or why, but Chris started to separate me from our third friend at this time. By the time the Bible study was over, it was around 8pm. It was dark, and we still had to walk back from the forest. Chris walked next to me and by my surprise grabbed my hand. The butterflies in my tummy were climbing up my esophagus. I was ecstatic to say the least. I believe he asked me to be his girlfriend shortly after. There was one more boy at church camp, and his name was Joe. He was not part of our friend group, but I still managed to speak with him a few times. He had a girlfriend called Kate. I think I was friends with Joe because he had given me a cigarette, which we smoked in complete secrecy. When we came back from the woods, Kate saw us together, and decided from that moment on that she would hate me. However, there was more bad blood. Nathan soon found out that Chris and I were an item, and did not speak to me at all afterwards. But it didn't keep him from watching me. Every time I looked up, whether it was in sermon or on break, he was staring. I thought I was safe because I was at church, and I would soon find out that I was not. It was the very last night off church camp. There was a huge concert, and it was almost magical. My heart was heavy to leave. At this point, Chris takes me by the hand and we go into the woods. I saw my first shooting star that night, and I also kissed my first boyfriend under the moon in an almost surreal atmosphere. 
While I was undergoing the greatest moment of my youth, Nathan was out for revenge. He knew that Kate was not my biggest fan. And that night, he gave her a handwritten note to put under my pillow. As every teenage girl is, she was nosy. She read what was a death threat, as well as a promise of sexual assault, and chose not to follow through with his intentions. She passed it to Joe, who gave it to the pastors. From there, the police were called, and Nathan ended up in a mental asylum. My parents were contacted. My father, who was a construction worker his entire life, told me that it was the most gruesome thing he'd ever read or heard. And my mother was in tears. I ended up going to court and got a restraining order against Nathan. Fast forward a year, and I was now no longer dating Chris. I'm pretty rambunctious to say the least and having nightmares regularly about Nathan and his letter to me. My parents and the police refused to tell me what was said. So I went to someone else who had read it, Joe. Joe told me he was in town one night and agreed to see me. I snuck out of my house to meet with him. I got into his car and he started driving. Joe did not take me home that night. In fact, Joe was a few years older than me, and I would go as far as to say he kidnapped me. As much as I begged, he wouldn't take me home. He tried to sleep with me that night. Luckily, after I cried enough, he decided to give up. The next morning, he was contacted by the police. They were about 10 minutes from sending out an Amber Alert by the time, and I was finally taken home. The worst part is I still have nightmares. Joe never told me what the letter said, although he had promised me he would. He only told me that one line that was fresh in his memory, I will punch out all your teeth and shove my thing down your throat until you can't breathe. Church camp ruined me. Nathan and Joe, let's not meet. I was camping at a popular campground in the mountains with my boyfriend, but it was November and it was their last open weekend. So no one was there. We were chatting and having a good time around the campfire and drinking. My boyfriend has to go pee. So he walked to the other side of the road and peed in the bushes. While over there, he very slowly and quietly got my attention and pointed out the large glowing eyes staring back at him from the bushes. He still has his wiener out while in the stair off with the mountain lion. We very carefully backed up and stayed really close to the fire until we went to bed in the car instead of the tent. We could hear it walking around after. The worst part was I went to find the pit toilet 15 minutes before this happened by myself. I even got slightly lost while trying to find it and was probably being stalked by the cougar. I've been pretty nervous camping ever since. A year ago, a group of us went camping in Kearney, Ontario, where we always go camping. Whenever we go, we always form our tents in a big circle with the fire pit in the middle of us. We've been drinking, smoking a few joints, and a few of us were tripping balls on shrooms. The first night we were there, this guy randomly walks into our circle, introduces himself, and says that he was in the military and decided to take some vacation to camp out for a bit. He asked if he could join our fire, as it was getting late and he didn't buy any firewood. Being the friendly stoned people we are, we let him join our fire. He even pitched in some money for the firewood. The night went on, and we were all having a good time. One by one, our group started heading off to bed. Me being either the second or third. I remember waking up to the sound of someone talking, and the fire being started. It was four in the morning 
and I peeped out my tent and saw the random just sitting on a log by the fire, talking to himself. Still tripping on shrooms, I thought to myself that I was in no condition to deal with this, and chalked it up to just me tripping out. I wake up the next day, and everyone is thankfully still alive, and the fire is smouldering. We look to the next campsite, where the random was staying, and it was spotless. No garbage, no tracks in the trail around the site, no nothing. We started talking about him just to be sure we all saw him. Through talking, we managed to figure out that he must not have slept at all. The last two of our group passed out just after 3.30. The first person got up just after 6 and noticed he was gone. The rest of our camping trip went well, and we all went home. Fast forward maybe four to five years, I flip on the news, and there's a picture of someone I could swear I recognize. He was arrested for a bunch of crimes, including sexual assault and murder. Guess who it was? It was the random guy who joined our fire. I don't know why I remembered his face, but I guess it was just a weird situation where my brain right clicked and saved a JPEG in my brain. Now, I have no way of proving if it was the same guy. We didn't take any pictures of the random, but the picture jump started my memory and made me instantly remember the weird random fire joiner. Either that, or they looked identical. Either way, it was profoundly creepy. This happened to me a few years ago, and I can really say it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Me and some friends were camping on a small island close to the mainland. Here in Norway during summer, it doesn't really get dark. We basically just have different shades of grey during the night. Around five in the morning, me and a friend were up, talking close to the water, huddled up in our sleeping bags drinking some Jägermeister. Covering the water is a thick mist. As the sun is rising, both me and my friend could swear that the mist is moving. We're there speechless, just watching the theatre unfold. You could see moving people on the water, kind of like walking or floating. They were all moving in one direction. Some of them were going in circles, the only thing that you could really see were the outlines of the figures. It was really peaceful as they were slowly migrating from one place to another. Both of us were talking a bit, and we could both see the same people. On one hand, they were just outlines, but on the other, they all had really clear characteristics. When I think back, it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. This happened when I was in the 8th grade. When I was around 14, I studied a subject focusing on outdoor pursuits. For our final assessment, two teachers took my class on a one-night camp where we would do activities like rock climbing, kayaking, trail walking, etc. I live in Australia around an hour from a state forest that was notorious for the backpacker murders. Several bodies have been found, and several more remain missing. I'm pretty sure that all of the murders were linked to the same serial killer. Anyway, in the morning we leave the school and drive out in a bus. When we reach the road that leads to the entrance of the forest, a police car is parked to the side. He spoke to the teacher for a moment, but I didn't hear anything, and no one else seemed to notice or care. Fast forward a few hours, and we've tracked, roughly 20 of us, to the camping area somewhere in the middle of the state forest. Some parts are state, some are privately owned. While kayaking that afternoon, we noticed a helicopter doing flybys, but again, my classmates never suspected anything. 
A couple of mates and I were the first to leave the water, and helped the teacher with some equipment, and started building our own rafts. I was standing off to the side, when one of the National Park guides walked over to one of the instructors, and talked in a hushed, slightly stressed out tone. I remember hearing the instructor say stuff like, you're kidding, and I don't believe it. He just looked shocked and taken aback. So at this point, I started connecting the dots, but I didn't say anything to my school friends. Around dusk that night, I go to use the toilet block, which is around 100 meters from my campsite. As I go in, I remember a guy walking around the other side of the block. I didn't see him very clearly in the diminished light, but he kept glancing around with nervous body language. I couldn't see his face clearly. He wasn't part of our party, and to me, he just didn't fit in. But I didn't think much of it at the time. Fast forward to the next morning when we get back to the car park. The teacher tells us that a body was found in a dam not too far from where we were. They didn't want to tell us as to not to frighten us. We later found out. It was a young guy who was killed with an axe, and the guy who did it was related to the serial killer who hunted in the same area. I don't know if it was the guy I'd seen, or if he had anything to do with the murders, but it freaked me out a lot afterwards, and I haven't been camping since. When I was 15, I was hunting in the Colorado Rockies for elk. We were around 12 to 15 miles up a mountain with no cell reception or anything. I'd been there twice before this incident took place and I was out with my uncle when we heard a woman scream. Curious and a little frightened, we decided to go check it out. We were hiking over a ridge for around 10 minutes when we saw bloody clothing and a t-shirt and shorts and nothing else. No footprints or anything to indicate where the scream had gone. We hightailed it back to camp and began to pack up, it being our last two days. We packed out the next day and went to the ranger's service and gave them the location of the scene. And that was it. They asked a few questions and said they'd follow up, but we never heard anything. In September of this year, I was hunting antelope out near the Red Desert in Wyoming. I had just shot my antelope and was walking about 150 yards out to where he had dropped, so I could tag and begin field dressing the animal. I should mention I'm about 40 miles away from the main road and have not seen another human or vehicle since I got off the main road. This area is extremely remote. It's even hard to describe. So as I'm walking out to the antelope, I look up and about one to two miles off in the distance, I see this extremely bright light zooming over the landscape and heading my way. I thought it was probably a game warden on a side by side coming to check my paperwork and all. No big deal. I keep walking out and find the animal and look up and see this light dives down into the sage bush and I can no longer see it. It was about a half mile from me when it disappeared. I also noticed I didn't hear any engines, if in fact it was someone on a motorized vehicle. I'm mostly confused at this point, not sure what the hell this light is or where it went, but I continue on tagging the antelope. It takes me all of 10 to 15 seconds to put the tag on. When I look up and see the light traveling away from me, and is about three to five miles away from me, going at least a hundred miles an hour. It was really zooming away faster than any vehicle could travel over that type of terrain. Also, there are no roads or anything where the light is traveling, so I don't know how it got so fast, and I'm pretty spooked at this point. I field dressed the animal as fast as I could and dragged it back to my truck. I had a very uneasy feeling at this point. 
I have no idea what that light was, although some others have speculated it was a drone. But if it were a drone operated by the game warden, why didn't he just come out once I got to my truck? I was hunting a big field for whitetail. It was public land, and I decided not to set up a tree stand and just sit behind some heavy cover on the ground. I tried to get to my spots well before sun's up, so I'm not making any noise at first light when many deer start to move. I got to my spot about 5 a.m. It was absolutely pitch black, and all I had was my headlamp. After I switched off my headlamp, it was quiet for about 30 seconds, when suddenly I heard a howl from my right side. It was clear the howl came from the edge of the field I was in, roughly 200 yards away. It sent shivers down my spine. About 30 seconds passed, and I heard a second howl in the opposite direction, on the other end of the field, probably 200 yards the other way. At this point, I'm pretty freaked out, but I figure it's highly unlikely anything would attack me. Not much longer, and from directly behind me, somewhere in the thick of the woods, a third howl. I now feel surrounded, and I'm terrified. My truck was around 500 yards away to the left, along the edge of the woods in the field, and down a narrow path that cuts right through the woods. I flicked on my headlamp, took the safety off my gun, equipped my hunting knife, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I waited until the sun came up before I went back and actually hunted. I never saw a deer that entire weekend. I presume whatever was howling drove the deer out, and I don't blame the deer one bit. The entire experience was very scary, and I've done a lot of hunting and camping, and spent a ton of time in the woods, both during the day and night, and nothing has ever freaked me out that badly. This story is probably over 40 years old now. From when my mum was a summer camp counsellor as a teenager. Every counsellor present swears this tale is true. The following tale is long and consists of a few smaller events rather than one single encounter. To give you an idea of the setting, it was, and still is, a pretty normal summer camp, about 300 to 400 acres, with five cabins each assigned a letter, A through E. Every Sunday, a new batch of campers would arrive around three to four in the afternoon, and on Saturdays, they'd leave by noon. Half the summer it would be boy campers, and then the other half they'd have girls. My mum was there for the two weeks during the girls' half. Cabins A, B and C were at the top of the hill, along with a small chapel, and D, which was basically used by councillors, and a meeting place is at the bottom of the hill. It is partially built into said hills so people could feasibly walk onto the roofs from the hill. And Cabin E, meanwhile, is located on another hill entirely. So, for the first week my mother's there, there aren't many kids, so they only have senior counsellors present. Most of them were between the ages of 17 to 21. My mum would have been around 17 or 18 since she was still in high school. On Thursday night, she and a few other female counsellors were hanging out in Cabin D and talking when they heard something on the roof. At first, they figured it was a raccoon, but then they realised the noise was way too loud. Two of the girls decided to go outside and investigate. While they looked at the roof, two of the male counsellors came running down the hill. Hey! I think we just saw a guy jump off the roof and run into the woods. And practically the moment they said that, they heard an unexpected sound, an engine. They look down at the access road and see a car's lights suddenly light up. 
Someone had parked there in the dark with the lights totally off. In a spot that was hidden from their view due to the trees and angle from their location. On top of that, they could now see another figure running to the car and hopping into the passenger side. At which point it tore out of its spot and sped off back towards town. So to recap, there's a man stomping around on the roof. The man jumped off and ran down the hill, crossed the creek and went onto the road, where another person was waiting in a car hidden from sight, with all the lights off, and then they drove away. This is obviously not normal. You know how in horror movies, teens and young adults tend to joke about the obvious signs there's a monster lurking around the corner, waiting for its target. Turns out, that is actually pretty accurate. Instead of getting creeped out like a rational person, my mum and the other counsellors found it more funny than anything and started joking around about it. Some of them threw out the name Nerd on the Roof, and it became a running joke among them, and they shortened it to Nor. Now, my mum's memory is a bit spotty about the timeline of this next particular event, but it's most likely that it happened on the Friday, the very next night. Remember how I said Cabernet was a bit far away from the others? Well, there was a vast swath of trees that also surrounded it. This cabin is so far removed from the rest of camp, it actually had its own telephone connecting it to the main part. Now this was during the 70s and cell phones did not exist yet. Since it was so remote, they usually assigned older campers to it. But during my mum's first week, they didn't have enough campers to need it though. So my mum and two other female counsellors were assigned to sleep there. So on Friday, the phone rings in the middle of the night and wakes them up. One of my mum's fellow counsellors answers groggily. Hello? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. She then hangs up, grabs a broom, leans it against the door handle, and crawls back into bed to try and return to the sweet land of sleep. Mum and her other counsellors are confused and ask what's going on. They get this sleepy response. Fred said he thought he saw someone in the woods and is heading down there with a gun. Instantly, my mum and the other girls are wide awake and go into panic mode as they recognise the potential setup for their starring scene in a real-life enactment of the plot of Friday the 13th. Meanwhile, the girl who answered the phone just tries to go back to sleep, apparently confident in the broom that will foil any attempts to break into the cabin. Fortunately for them, no one came busting down the fortified door, and soon enough, one of the male counsellors arrived with a shotgun. He stayed over for the rest of the night, since he, like my mum and counsellor number two, had some doubts about how effective a broom is at keeping out intruders. As you can probably tell, my mum now finds this particular part of the story funny due to her friend's lack of reaction and survival instincts. It helps that the night passed peacefully, with no more signs or scary events. However, the next morning they find the phone line had been cut. That is a little less funny, and made them a bit more wary. But this whole night would just be more of an afterthought after the next events. Cut to the next day. As I said earlier, the campers would leave on Saturday morning, giving the counsellors a bit of free time until the next batch arrived on Sunday. They'd go into town on Saturday afternoon to get laundry done and pick up essentials. Now, despite having two summer camps, this was a small town. Small enough that it only published a tabloid-sized newspaper once a week, on Saturdays. This week, one of the counsellors just happened to pick up a copy. It was mostly forgotten until later that night, 
when they were hanging out in the pavilion playing cards. In between turns, someone glanced at the police blotter and suddenly exclaimed, Oh my god! And they began reading out loud. Remember that other camp I mentioned? At the end of the access road. It was smaller than theirs, and instead of cabins, it placed kids in tents along with a counsellor. At some point that week, there was an attempted kidnapping from there. When I say attempted kidnapping, I don't mean someone tried to pick up a kid who wandered away from camp or looked like they were alone. He opened an occupied tent in the middle of the night, picked up a random kid in full view of the other campers and counsellors, and just took off running, carrying this random child. This is, quite possibly, the most blatant attempt I've ever heard of to date. I actually had to pause the conversation with my mother at this point to check the kid's age, eight or nine for the record, because the idea of a man running into the woods whilst carrying a child is just so ludicrous. The counsellor in the tent naturally gave chase, because one does not just sit by when a random character opens your tent and scoops up your child. Eventually the man had to drop the boy in order to get away at which point the counsellor stopped his pursuit to redirect his attention to the obviously traumatised child. The guy was never caught. Needless to say, all of my mother's fellow counsellors were freaked out by this, and also outraged that they hadn't been informed of this since this camp was literally just up the road. The same road where they saw two mysterious strangers flee two nights prior. Suddenly, the nerd on the roof was not so funny. Two weeks arrives, and my mum can't remember if the phone line to Kevin E got repaired in this time or not. But they had more campers this week, so a group of older girls were assigned to it as per custom. Mum and the other counsellors continued to stay there as well. At the end of the week on Friday nights, they would gather the kids there for what she calls an Indian pageant. Again, this was the 70s, it was a very different time. What an Indian pageant involves, I don't know, and it's irrelevant to this story. All that matters is that all the kids and most of the counsellors were gathered there that night, rounding off the week with one last hurrah before they left the next day. While this went on, someone came running to the pageant grounds, my mum can't remember who it was anymore, but they grabbed her and a couple of other counsellors and pulled them aside. Someone had broken into cabin E. Cabin E. The cabin my mum and two other counsellors were occupying, along with a group of older girls. The isolated cabin, at the exact opposite end of camp. They took off running, and because of the distance it took ten minutes to reach it. When they got inside, they found something out of a horror movie. Someone had gotten into the camper's belongings and torn it all up. She describes the kids' bras lining the rafters, sleeping bags and pillows all slashed up. The clothes were cut to pieces and strewn about. The cabin was a total mess, and all of the camper's belongings were write-offs. But the most chilling of all in the mirror, someone had emptied the girl's toothpaste to write a simple message. The Gnaw was here. I don't think I need to explain how terrifying that was. They'd spent about half an hour cleaning up the cabin before the girls could return. The kids were obviously upset to find their belongings destroyed, but were told that a raccoon had gotten inside. As far as they knew, it was just a bad stroke of luck. The night passed, and the campers left the next day with no more incidents. Mum's two weeks were up, and she went home. She's still in close contact with a lot of her fellow counsellors from that time, and they confirmed the Nor did not return after that. This ends the chronicle of the nerd on the roof. However, there are some final points worth noting that don't fit any of the above. Specifically, 
there was a strong chance that the nerd on the roof and the man who vandalized Cabinet were different people. The camp had a very nice couple living there as caretakers, along with an adult son who was not so nice. He always gave off creepy vibes. Mum and the other counsellors now suspect that he overheard them talking about the Nora at some point, since they talked about him a lot, and used it as inspiration to break into the cabin as some sort of sick joke. However, since he lived on the campgrounds, it made no sense for him to be the one who jumped off the roof and run to a getaway car that gunned towards town. One theory I have about this is that the original nerd on the roof was the attempted kidnapper, scouting the camp in advance. The fact that Cabin D is at the bottom of the hill with three occupied cabins, that makes this seem even more unlikely. When he realised he'd been spotted, he ran off to where his partner was waiting to drive away. If true, it just adds an extra layer to how premeditated the attempted kidnapping was. But after having my mum retell the story and write this up, I realised something that was even more disturbing. As I mentioned earlier, my mother's memory of the exact timeline is a bit spotty. We placed the phone line incident on Friday because she remembers the counsellors were on edge after the Norse sighting, but they hadn't seen the headline about the attempted kidnapping. Since it's been over 40 years, she doesn't remember exactly which day the attempted kidnapping at the neighbouring camp occurred, only that it wasn't the same day as the Nor incident. In other words, there's a chance the kidnapping attempt happened on Friday night and the other camp is in the same direction as Cabernet. I don't think I need to say any more. This happened after my hunt for some whitetail in northern Michigan. I was leaving the woods and heading to my car, preparing myself for the long ride home. The sun was setting and the air was crisp, and the smell of fall was in the air. As I got to my car, I heard some rustling in the brush on the other side of the trail I was parked on. Thinking it was an animal, I looked across and saw a guy standing there. He was slightly swaying from side to side. Not a drunk sway, but more of an impatient standing in line for a long time type of sway. Hey man, are you lost? I said. He didn't answer, but he gave the creepiest smirk and tilted his head back slightly, without taking his eyes off me. Needless to say, I was creeped the hell out. My gun made me feel protected, but as I loaded my pack and my shotgun into the car, I didn't take my eyes off him, and he kept his locked on mine. I kept my 9mm on me in case he tried something, and I was parked parallel to the trail. So when I got in the car, I could still see him. I drove and checked my mirror, and he was in the middle of the trail just walking in my direction. That was the creepiest day hunting I have ever had. I am an avid hunter. I go every season, and I love it. More often than not, I don't kill any game but I just love getting out into the woods. I don't know if you're familiar with hunting seasons in Pennsylvania, but during late November, rifle season is in full swing. It was already the second week of the season, and I had yet to bag any deer, so I was eager to get to it early in the morning. And I did. I normally get up around 5am and drive to my hunting spot. It's private land that my grandfather owns, him and I are the only two who hunt on it, and the rest is posted to hunters, and the only others on the land are employed on my grandfather's farm. I had originally planned on calling my grandfather when I woke up and asking him if he wanted to tag along, but the weather that morning was horrendous. Snow was pouring down and the wind was really strong. I love hunting in the snow, but it almost made me decide not to go so I knew he wouldn't want to. 
The roads were really bad, so it took me a bit longer to drive there. Normally, the sun would be starting to rise by now, however it was overcast and snowing. Regardless of the snow, I walked up to my spot. It was directly behind my grandfather's house, over a hill about 100 to 150 yards away. Almost immediately upon sitting on my spot, I hear things moving all around me. Honestly, I didn't pay it much mind. It could be any number of things, but it was still pitch black, and the thought that it was a deer had crossed my mind. But there wasn't much I could do. It's not like I can shoot at it. So I just ignore it and continue to wait. It wasn't much longer after that, that I began hearing something walking just over the ridge to my right. At this point, there's barely enough light to see my feet. So even if it was a deer, there was still nothing I could do. However, I could tell it wasn't a deer. I just assumed it was my grandfather walking to his spot, which is just a short walk from mine. But the lights in his house were off. And if he was hunting up here, I'm sure he'd have let me know beforehand. But even if it wasn't him, it was a hunter, albeit hunting illegally. I still wanted to let him know I was here, so I turned on my flashlight and pointed it in his direction, flashing it several times. Again, even if it were a deer, I couldn't shoot it. So I felt it was better to be safe rather than sorry. Nothing much happened after that. After I flashed my light, the noise stopped, which was really odd. I didn't hear them turn back. So I figured that they either, one, sat down right there after seeing my light, which is considered extremely rude, or B, I didn't hear them walk off. I just assumed it was the latter. An hour or so passes, and finally the first signs of daylight start to shine through. It's still snowing and the snow is falling in entire snowballs rather than snowflakes. So visibility is pretty limited, but I just grinned and bared it. I love snow. And even if I couldn't see any deer, I still found the weather beautiful. It was around this time I noticed an odd looking lump protruding out of the group of trees that was on the top of the hill that separated me from my grandfather's house. Right where I had heard movement earlier, it looked like a mound of dirt. However, it was sticking out the side of a tree. So obviously it wasn't dirt. Naturally, I raised my rifle up to take a closer look. And I could immediately tell that I was looking at the side of an old style camouflage coat. It took a minute, but it finally clicked. That was a person over there. I just thought it was a hunter. So I didn't know what to do about it. I knew he was hunting on our land illegally, and from what I could see, he wasn't wearing anything orange, which is required by all hunters during rifle season. And I could just tell from looking, whoever this was, it wasn't my grandfather. I sat there for a minute debating my next move, but I decided to call him at the risk of blowing his hunt if that was him over there. So without taking my eyes off the guy, I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. To my dismay, he picked up and told him what was going on. So he told me he'd make his way up. But I decided on my own to give this guy a whistle to let him know I'd seen him. But he didn't react at all. After a few minutes, I started to walk up to this guy. And after walking a short distance, I could clearly see him. He was sound asleep tucked in between a shrub and a couple of trees. He obviously thought out where to lay, as I would have never been able to see him if his coat hadn't have stuck out. And as I thought, he had no orange on him. I gave him another whistle and he woke up much louder this time, almost immediately shuffling over to hide his exposed coat. He had a nasty scruffy beard and a gray hat and honestly, he looked like a harmless old homeless man, probably in his mid fifties, but he had a perfect view of my granddad's home from his spot. And I have a pretty good idea what he was planning to do once my granddad left the house. Once this guy realized he'd been caught, 
and saw a mad six foot five guy carrying a hunting rifle less than 10 yards away, making his way closer, his face went pale. Almost instantly, he tried to feed me some bullshit lie that he'd gotten lost during a drive with another group of hunters. A drive is a coordinated push through a thicket in order to drive deer to hunters sitting at the end of a designated driving area. However, the closest public game land is miles from this spot, so I knew it was a lie. He just kept on going on about how he was lost and how he fell asleep. He even went as far as to make up a fake name on the spot. I just stood there and listened, making sure he didn't make any fishy movements. I couldn't help but think about what this guy could have done to my grandfather. God knows he had the chance. And that thought pissed me off enough to tell the guy to shut up. And that's about the point where I saw my granddad. My granddad is a tough old geezer. So my first thought was, this idiot is gonna get himself killed. Luckily, nothing happened. After he got there, we practically had to drag this guy down the road where my granddad called the cops and I called my dad. Technically, this guy hadn't done anything wrong yet. So all we could do was charge him with trespassing and stalking. That was about a month ago. And since then, I haven't heard anything else about him. And I don't want to. I have a hunting spot that I frequent. Not crazy far off the grid or anything like that. Terrain is a pain in the ass, but it's a pretty hidden spot that is close to my house. Anyway, I hunt a lot of small game there and see a ton of mule deer any time I go out. One morning I get there about 5.30 and have some time to kill before I start my hike in. I have an odd feeling in the parking lot but just chalk it up to too much coffee on an empty stomach. That's giving me anxiety. So I decide to start hiking in, and about 300 yards into my hike, I notice this pile of downed trees slash branches slash general debris that I hadn't seen before. It was my first time hunting in this particular place on this particular season. So I figured some folks came out and did some fire migration work. I didn't pay too much attention to it until I noticed there's an odd amount of movement coming from it. Pretty small movement, but it sticks out when a brush pile is wiggling on a still day. It was also about 5.45 a.m. and the wilderness just sort of has this stillness to it. And at this point, any movement is noticeable. So I stopped and start examining the pile to figure out what's going on. I figure there's a rabbit in there, maybe some squirrels, and I figure I've hit the jackpot, and I'm definitely going to bag something. I start deciding the best way to flush whatever it is out, and still have my shotgun up in time to take a good shot. I realise I'm standing by a decent sized branch, and my best move is to stomp on the branch. If all goes according to plan, everything will freeze, then whatever is in there will dart out. I try to figure out where the rabbit will come out of, get ready, and bam, I stomp on the branch and snap it in half. The pile goes still, and that stillness is quiet. Then a mountain lion, with a bloody nose and mouth, pops out of the pile. At this point, I'm about 10 yards away from it. I have a shotgun, but really don't want to shoot the lion. I also don't want to fire a shot off in the air to scare it, because all of this was a pretty cool experience that very few people get to have. I froze, and it was looking at me very quizzically. Then, in one quick motion, it hopped out of the brush pile, ran uphill, and got about 40 yards away from me, and disappeared into the trees. I've never seen something cover 40 yards uphill in such a fast and graceful way. One of the coolest things I've ever gotten to experience. I went to check out the brush pile when it left, and sure enough, it was feasting on a mule deer. Still my favourite story from whenever I was out in the woods. I was turkey hunting. 
full gobbler, I think, if I recall correctly. Anyway, I was walking to my spot in my orange, and had just started to tuck it away. For non-hunters, turkey can see colour, so the regulation states that hunters need to wear 250 square inches of orange while moving, but you can take it off and just wear regular camo when you get to your spot. In my management zone, you just need to put some orange somewhere within 15 feet of you to let other hunters know you're in the area, and to be vigilant. I finish up stowing my orange away, and sit down and start using my call. I eventually hear something coming from away, and it's calling back. As the sound gets closer, I start to think that maybe it's too big to be a turkey. Maybe it's a small flock. I go to call again, and a shot goes off far too close for me, and I shit bricks. I had not seen anyone come in, nor had I seen any orange hanging in a tree to signify someone else was hunting there, so I thought I was pretty isolated. Another shot goes off, closer, and the chucking call starts back up. Now I'm certain of two things. One, there is no turkey, as they would have scattered because of the shots, and two, I have an idiot out here trying to stalk me thinking I'm a turkey, and he's following my calls and shooting blind, or seeing me move and assuming I'm a bird. Either way, I'm shitting bricks, and I decide to yell out, Hold butt, I'm not a bird, quit shooting, and another shot goes off. I'm terrified to so much as wiggle a finger at this point, because I can't see this guy, but I know he's shooting in my direction and trigger happy. I'm sitting there hollering that I'm a human, and contemplating the idea of moving to grab my orange, and wave it to signify to this guy that he's shooting at a person. When a third shot goes off, and I actually hear the BBs hitting shit near me. I hit the deck, and laid flat for two hours, absolutely crapping myself until I was sure they were gone. For any non-hunters out there, this is a known issue within turkey hunting, because you need to remove your visibility orange, and because you're calling as an attractant, some assholes will attempt to stalk what they think is a turkey, and end up stalking another hunter, and in their idiot fervour, they shoot at the first thing that moves. Say another hunter itching their nose, a good number of people had died that way, and it made me swear off turkey hunting. My father used to enjoy going to this camping ground, not far from the hometown he grew up in. The campground was in Cavendish, Vermont. It was a place called Catton Place. He enjoyed how peaceful and remote the area was. Having been there a few times, and observing that it was family friendly, he thought it would be nice to bring his daughter with him, choosing to go around the same time of year that he went the last few times. He saw familiar faces. There was this campsite of three men who were out of staters in their mid forties. Most likely were from Boston because of their accent. They had a big fancy trailer and the entire site was decked out with a dartboard, hammock, lawn chairs, garden gnomes, and patches of fake grass. From observation, it looked like they were there to stay a few weeks at a time, or settled in, quite comfortable. Too comfortable, actually. To the point where they walk around with a sense of superiority, boastful, and loud like they owned the place. The place was actually run by an elderly couple. These macho acting goons were quite friendly with them. The year before, they painted the playground for them for free, so the elderly couple loved these guys. My father saw these men around last time, but didn't have to deal with them or worry much about their camp, because it was situated quite far. This time, unfortunately, we were placed quite close to them, with only one empty campsite separating us. 
We were surrounded by other empty campsites too. But around 30 feet away, there was also a middle aged couple camping out. Here is where the story starts. We arrive and set up our camp. I remember observing those men across from us. My father waved a friendly hello to them. And they waved back. Throughout the day, I played on the playground. By nighttime, we roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. Meanwhile, those macho goons across the way were partying hard. Booze everywhere and blaring tunes on the radio. Lots of laughs and bickering too. But we didn't pay much attention or look over that way as we were keeping to ourselves. Tired yawns and we crawled into our tent to sleep. But all the ruckus was still going on. I was able to fall asleep. But my father was not. He laid there for a few hours and kept checking on the time occasionally. It was getting closer to midnight. He wondered if the middle aged couple nearby were having trouble sleeping over this noise too. Then the sound can be heard of a vehicle coming down the road. It was the elderly man who owned the place. He stops and lets the men know that there has been a noise complaint. The men apologize profusely and say that they'll be settling in to sleep soon. And the owner leaves. They immediately start cussing and throwing things about their campsite as soon as the owner was out of sight. They were offended that someone had reported them. Who do you think did it? One of them asks the other. Well, it's either the guy with the little girl next to us, or the other couple over there. The other guy responds. And the third guy adds, I didn't see any of them leave their car to go to the front desk. So one of those people must have a cell phone. This was 1977. So cell phones weren't as common back then. These men had begun conspiring to figure out who owns the cell phone. They weren't trying very hard to speak in hushed tones, because my father could hear everything. I bet it's the arsehole with the Cadillac who owns the cell phone. I'm going over there. One of them says. They're talking about my father. He does not have a cell phone though. The feeling of pure fear came over him. He had no idea what was going to happen and needed to think fast. The sound of stumbling footsteps came right up just inches away from our tent. What to do? What to do? My dad thought of making a noise, any noise. He grabbed the soda can next to him and flicked the top of it with his fingers. The guy was startled and took a step back and then scurried away back to his drunken buddies. They're now whispering amongst themselves. He can't pick up on what they're saying, but catches the part where they say they're going to try again later. He wonders if he's heard that right. What the hell are these guys trying to do? There's no way my father is going to try and fall asleep now. In fact, he's not feeling tired at all. Hopped up on so much adrenaline right now from the fear man with his daughter feeling helpless, only a soda can and a flashlight to protect us. My dad lays there frozen, listening, listening, and listening, hoping these guys will just give it up and get some sleep, sleep off their drunken craziness as it were. A short time passes. And here comes the footsteps again. Their campfire is so bright that it casts a shadow into our tent. He can literally see the shadow of a man coming towards us. The man doesn't get as close this time. Because again, he stops at the noise coming from our tent. My dad had to unzip his sleeping bag in a panic ready to defend and protect us in case this man was going to try and come into our tent. The man isn't moving anymore. 
He's just standing there, watching us. My dad remembered he had a lighter in his pocket. He took it out from underneath the blanket, flicked the switch on it, as he was hoping it would mimic the sound of getting a gun ready. I don't think it worked. But the man eventually did turn around and go back to their campsite. You won't believe this. They're still awake. What the hell? They will splutter amongst themselves. Maybe, just maybe, being around 2.30 a.m., they will finally go to sleep. Nope. At this point, I'm still asleep, but I'm tossing and turning a lot. My feet slap against the side of the tent a couple of times. The footsteps are approaching us again. While I brush my feet against the side of the tent, Ugh, the man says, with an exasperated sigh. He starts to walk away, but not to his campsite. He starts walking towards the road, walks a few feet, stops, and then screams at the top of his lungs, if I find out who reported us, I will kill you. You hear me? I will end you. Everything is still now. The only sounds that can be heard is the crackling of the campfire and the occasional indistinct chatter amongst the men. Then, finally, the sound of their trailer door shuts at 5am. They're asleep. My dad lays there trying to process everything that had happened. By 6am he wakes me up to pack and get out of there. I remember him rushing me and I was all confused. My dad then said, he's never going camping again. That statement is still true. He never has been camping since. I have so many questions though. What did they want? Why did they need us to be asleep to sneak up on us? Did they want to harm my dad or myself? Did they want to steal the cell phone that he never had? I guess we'll never know. But it's so scary to think about, and I know that my father should have talked to the owners and made a police report too. I'm not sure if it crossed his mind in those moments. I assume that in this sleepless night state of mind, he just wanted to get away, far away, and back to the comfort of his own home. I used to deliver packages in the mail for a company in the south. A lot of the daily routes were in the hills and woods. Last year, I had a route that was super deep country. I was used to back roads and the country now at this point. There are houses I stopped at where the driveway was super steep. But for the most part, everyone was always super friendly out there country folk. Well, I had a delivery that was down this long gravel street. There was only a few houses on my journey to the house that my delivery was. Still, at this point, I'm totally fine. There's a ton of these types of roads around here. Well, I arrive at my destination. There's no mailbox, no driveway and no gravel. You could make out a little bit of path that had been made from cars driving to the house. But I'm serious when I say a little bit. The driveway, if you can even call it that, is maybe 250 yards long, with a house at the end of it. I'm only sketched out because I'm in the woods, and the land is super unpredictable back there. Meaning you never know when there's just a drop off. I'm in a huge box truck. So if one tire were to slip off the side, the whole thing is going down. So I'm driving literally probably less than a mile an hour, taking my time, being extremely cautious. As I'm making this drive back to the house, I start kind of checking out my surroundings. I pass a really old, broken down truck that the ground had started to grow around. Again, super common back here, no biggie. As I get further and further down the driveway, 
I notice that I've probably passed about four satellite dishes, like cable dishes, and I start approaching the house. The house from the outside looks like it's a Walter White season five style cabin. It's a shack. I park and kind of just check out my surroundings. After about a minute, I was like, okay, I'm just going to deliver it and leave. I walk up to the front door of this cabin thing, and the front door had a large glass window in it. Not modern, think old. Like a cabin that was built in the late 50s with no repairs. As I sit, the small package down in front of the door, I glance inside the house. The main room, which would be like a living room I'm guessing, is completely empty. The only thing that is in this room is two foldable metal chairs, both unfolded, both facing the corner of the room, but nothing is in the corner. In the meantime, I'm trying to do my job with my right hand, where I keep making very quick glances inside. From what I saw, there was nothing in that house. Nothing. It was a shell. The kitchen may have had old appliances in it, but I wasn't really paying attention to that part. My sixth sense kicked in, and my brain said that this obviously wasn't right. So I turned around and started walking back to my truck, maybe 30 feet away. I take my hood off my head and take my hat off so I can have a full peripheral view around me. I immediately start looking to see where the closest neighbor's house is, and I see a building up the hill just a tiny bit away. But it honestly looked like it was on this guy's property. I'm sure this was my head playing major tricks on me. But as I'm walking back to my truck, I just feel a presence. I feel like it's just hanging onto my back, getting heavier and heavier with every single step closer to the van I take. I jumped in my van, locked the doors, and checked to make sure there was no one there. Shit. The driveway. I back out of this entire driveway while checking my surroundings everywhere. And as I'm driving down the road, maybe 40 feet away from this dude's entrance of the driveway, there's a trash bag in the middle of the street. It's opened just a little bit. I slow down, and it looks like there's a woman's sweater or something in there. Was that a kill room? Was someone or multiple people held hostage on that property? Something was up. I immediately contacted my buddy and told him about it. He suggested I go back and snag a few pictures. I agreed. About five minutes go by and I make it back to the address, and the trash bag is completely gone. I looked everywhere on the street, and the side of the street, completely gone. But get this, I always thought about how I never know what I am delivering, or who I am delivering to. When I first landed this job, I remember thinking how crazy it would be if someone was holding people hostage in their house, torturing them and ordered their food and house supplies online because they're afraid of leaving the house with their kidnapped people alone. That's all I could think about when dropping off this package. I left that job not even a week later for different reasons, but I did tell my boss and he assured me he would contact the local police department and take that house off our normal route schedule. I never heard anything back about it. I am aware that if police went out there and found something or people, I would immediately be called in to tell them what I saw. So I'm going to assume that they went out to check it out and found nothing. But in the same sense, it makes me wonder about the trash bag immediately disappearing after I left. Did they realize that they messed up and I was going to say something that they had prepared for? I don't know. I also have no clue what the address was or how to get there by memory to check it out for myself. 
but I think about that very often, and every single time I do, I get chills down my spine, just because of the thoughts of the unknown. I live in Michigan, and regularly go out trapping or coyote hunting. One day, I'm taking a long time friend hunting for the first time. He lived out of state, so he wasn't familiar with the area and its types of people and habits, so to speak. It was winter time in Michigan, and at the time we were actually having one of our coldest winters on record. We were walking along, and unfortunately, the coyote spot I usually used had now become useless after so many uses of traps and shots taken there. So we went a bit deeper to look for a better spot. The coyotes had a den in some lowlands and thick brush. I don't usually go out there, but I didn't want my friend's first hunt to be boring. So we pressed on. After a bit of walking, my friend noticed a blood trail, and I assumed another hunter hit and wounded one. I figured we would track to make sure it didn't suffer, so we followed the blood trail. The strange part was we didn't notice any tracks, and it was winter, so tracks would be easy to spot. However, when we reached the source, we ended up finding something a lot more gruesome. We came across the dead bodies of a man and a woman. The man had a crossbow bolt in his stomach, and looked like he had been stabbed. The woman was stabbed much worse, and looked like she had been sexually assaulted. Needless to say, we called the police. Additionally, it seems the suspect was caught, although not by law enforcement. It turns out the girl he murdered was his ex-wife, who ended up divorcing him, and the guy was her new boyfriend. The guy who killed them actually ended up running back into the lowland swamp area where he had kind of a lean setup, where he was found dead from frostbite, and drinking far too much, and passing out in the cold. Drugs also seem to have been involved. The crossbow bolt that the couple were shot with actually had high amounts of some kind of venom, or would it be poison, on the tip, although it seemed to be a paralyzing one. Also due to the heavy amount of snowfall, the blood trail was extremely visible even in low light. But according to the police report, it seems like the conclusion was, the guy was hit by the bolt, became unable to move, and the woman ended up attempting to drag him to safety with him, trailing behind her, thus running over her tracks for the most part. Which might explain why we were unable to see what would otherwise be easily identifiable footprints. Although, because he was a fairly larger guy, she wasn't able to drag him for long, until her ex caught up. I've never been back to those woods since, and now when I go out, I always wear body armour underneath my vest, and make sure I'm not alone. This happened to my father-in-law about 10 years ago, at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we are heading there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods, this would have freaked me out. So, as some people probably know, we get an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, or ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep into the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours. It was getting light, and he was reading a book while he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She is calling out, Hunter! Oh, Hunter. Very sing-songy, like a mother calling her child for dinner, as he played outside. Now, as I said, 
He's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket going into your stand, which is why we have to get out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. He first thought the woman was calling someone called Hunter, perhaps her son. She called again and he realised that he is Hunter. So he turns around, peers around the trees and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater and asks if he can come and take a look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't set in yet, and he's a give a shirt off his back kind of guy. Not to mention, six foot two and nearly 300 pounds with a gun. So he wasn't too worried about this small woman, and starts getting down the tree to have a look. He follows her back to her modal home, which borders our hunting lands, and are probably about a 10 minute walk away. And she walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, and he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring onto the floor. He walks over, turns the valve off, sticks his head into the house, and says hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems empty. Empty of people anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered, and nopes the hell out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now we have hunted this land for years since, and have never seen anyone at this place. Although, until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So every year I pass by her place, and I always think to myself that I definitely don't want to meet the lady in the trailer with messed up plumbing who may or may not have had nefarious intentions for my father-in-law. I can't explain this, but we were hunting 25 years ago and we found a white-tailed deer frozen into a river by his feet. This is where it gets weird. This animal was cut in half. His rear end was missing, but it was how clean the cut was. It had looked like it was done with a bandsaw. Also, the animal had been gutted like it was cleaned out with an ice cream scoop, completely cleaned. No blood trail, no guts just half a frozen deer in the ice, eyes wide open, missing its entire backside. I've got no explanation for this, and I really don't think I even want to think about it anymore, as I still can't even fathom what happened. Back when I was 16, me and my friends spent a lot of time together at a caravan site on the outskirts of my town. One of my friends, Jack, had a little cabin there that his parents owned. We spent most of our evenings at that cabin, drinking and hanging out. We'd have the occasional barbecue or party, but mostly it was just a chilled place to go and relax. One night, it was one of my friend's birthdays. So naturally, we headed to the caravan site for a night of underaged drinking. It was about 10 p.m. or so when we realized we'd run out of alcohol. So the oldest looking of us, Nathan and Tom, volunteered to pop to the nearest corner store to stock up on drinks. While they were gone, we just listened to music and played on the Xbox. Just less than an hour went by before we heard a loud bang on the window. I pulled back the curtains with a wide grin on my face, 
thinking it was Nathan Tomback with the drinks and trying to scare us. It was so dark outside, I couldn't see them. I stuck my tongue out to the night and shut the curtains. They could come in the unlocked front door any time they wanted. Suddenly, a bang came on the window again, quickly followed by a series of loud and violent bangs on the side of the cabin. We heard a man's voice angrily shout, Oi! from outside. Oi! You in there? This wasn't Nathan and Tom. Jack got up to go outside and see what was going on. He just opened the door when a bald, stocky man in his 40s grabbed Jack by the scruff of the neck. We didn't know what to do. This man just shook Jack and yelled in his face. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but he was furious. Then the banging started again. There were more men circling the cabin and banging on the walls and windows. Me and my friends just stood at the edge of the room, as far away from the windows as we could, not doing or saying anything, whilst poor Jack was being beaten outside. In hindsight, we should have helped him, but hell, from the sounds of it there were ten or so men outside, and we weren't about to face them. One of them was shouting that he was going to kill him, over and over. We couldn't call the police either. We just spent the whole time underage drinking and didn't want to get ourselves in trouble. I texted Nathan and Tom to let them know what was happening and to not come back to the cabin. But they had arrived as the men were hiding round the back. After what seemed like hours, but must have only been about 30 minutes, it suddenly went silent. We tentatively went to the door, but the men and Jack were gone. Worried about our friend, we all went looking for him, and found him sat at the far end of the caravan park by the river, head in his hands. We asked if he was okay, but he told us to piss off. After that, we just went back to the cabin in silence, and waited for him to come back. He didn't. Jack stopped showing up for school after that. Turns out he'd had a breakdown following the incident, and would spend most of his time locked away in his room. We only found this out from his parents. I haven't spoken to Jack in years, and we never went back to the cabin following that night. I still don't know who those men were, or what they wanted with Jack, or why they all went away so quietly. My dad wanted to take me hunting for the first time ever. He's always been very big on hunting, and his father before him. So he wanted to take his only son out to make it a father-son kind of thing. I, however, had no interest in hunting, and was far more interested in spending my time inside on my violin or on video games, which this was neither of but I relented and went out with him anyway. He taught me how to use a gun and told me all the tricks of the trade, that we'd be hiding and we had to get out ridiculously early to make our spot and that we'd wait in silence for movement. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Anyway, we get there ridiculously early. It must have been at least 5 a.m. at latest when we had to make our spot. We sat there in silence, with him occasionally whispering to me that the deers will come out at first light, and that would be our best chance. So there we are waiting, in silence, father and son. I'm not really sure what happened, but it was dark, and it stayed dark. It never got light. About an hour passes and I was bored reading my book. So I turn to my dad and ask him what the time is. He looks at his digital watch, one of those Casio watches from back in the day, and all of the segments were black. 
I don't really know if that's how you best describe it. But instead of showing the numbers, every part of the watch that had a part to show was black. So it almost looked like it was 88888. So it almost looked like the time was 8888. Because everything was filled in, if you understand what I mean. Anyway, he shakes it, presses some buttons, but it doesn't do anything. We say that it's a bit weird and that it should be a little bit sunny by now, and that first light should have broken through. But we sit and wait. I estimate that another half hour to an hour passes, and I'm getting really bored. I know the time we left because I remember setting my alarm, and it should be about 7.30 now, so definitely bright. There's no way it's still dark. I tell my dad I'm getting out, and that I don't care if I make noise because it's this so creepy. He doesn't argue and gets out with me. We start walking back to the car. When we get there, he turns it on to check the time on the internal clock, and it says it's 9.30 p.m. We just about lose our minds. We're not really sure what's going on, but we quickly go back, pack up our stuff and leave. When we get home, my mother comments that it was strange she didn't hear from us, as we usually text her, or at least my father does when something eventful happens, and asks if we didn't manage to bag anything. We just kind of nod and try and pretend this didn't happen. About a week later, we try and talk about it. Neither of us know what went on that night or day. I don't even know what it was anymore, but we were really messed up. How did we lose a day? Where did an entire day go? I'm lost for words and would love an explanation. This all happened in mid-October. My family owns about 160 acres out in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbour is a friend, who would let rent the pasture for his cattle when he needed to. Some friends and I decided we wanted to build a little cabin out there, so that we could hang out. So one weekend, one of my friends and I loaded up a tractor that we were renting from his dad, and headed out there. It was just me and him that weekend, as everyone else was busy. We got there a little late, since it took a while to get everything loaded and packed up for the weekend. He sat about, setting up our tents, and I made our fire. As I did, I made an odd discovery. There was a phone book from a few towns over, still in its plastic sleeve, right next to our fire pit. I picked it up and showed it to my friend, we both enjoyed scaring ourselves, and I've made the comment that we weren't alone out here. We both laughed at it. Later that night, we're sitting around the campfire, talking and bullshitting. There was a big bright moon that night, and a bit of the breeze which made whatever leaves were left rustle. It was a little creepy, but we enjoyed the atmosphere. We noticed, however, someone crossing through the middle of the field, their body just visible from the moonlight. At first it was a little odd. My friend and I discussed for a few seconds if we should confront him, but I made the suggestion that he was probably just taking a shortcut across a field. Although I didn't really like it, it wasn't a big deal. If we caught him doing it again, we would confront him, we decided. The rest of the night passed pretty uneventfully, but eventually we got in our tent and laid down. We were probably 20 or so feet from the fire pit, which was by that point burning quite low. We talked for a few minutes, and then we go silent trying to fall asleep. As we're laying there, we hear something. It sounded like quiet footsteps walking around the fire pit. We both look at each other silent, and then we hear a piece of wood get thrown in the fire, and it flamed up quite a bit. I grabbed the shotgun that I always keep in the tent, and quickly racked it. We heard someone run away, 
but by the time we got out, they were too far. The rest of the weekend was pretty quiet, and the events of the first night seemed kind of dreamy to us. We just cleared out the area for the cabin, and cut and stacked the trees we cut for firewood. Next weekend we get out there. My uncle was out there with us as well, and went to check out his game cams. This is where it gets much more worrying for us. My uncle told us he was pissed, because someone had stolen the batteries and SD cards out of the cameras. We told him about what happened the weekend before, and then parted ways. When we got out there, we noticed quite a bit of our wood we had cut and stacked was already gone. And we were the last people to camp out there, which means someone had come out and had themselves a fire. We then went and checked on the tractor, which we had left down there. We found it had been broken into, and the chainsaw which we'd left in the cab had also been stolen. To make a long story short, Nothing else so far happened. I was hesitant for a few weeks to continue with the cabin, since we weren't there all the time. I was worried it would be an incentive for whoever was there to stay. I'm not sure if it was transient, or a local, or who. If for some reason anything else happens, I'll let you know. Local law enforcement and the adjacent landowners know about the situation. A friend and I also went down there and put up no trespassing signs around the property. We also hid some trail cams around the building site, so if anyone messes around there, we can hopefully get a good picture. 